Oh, you think there's nothing strange going on with reality? Well, then explain this. And if that doesn't convince you, what if I told you that the scientific community, by in large, agrees that reality is not what it seems to be, that it is not locally real. You may have seen this article floating around. It's called, The Universe is Not Locally Real and the Physics Nobel Prize Winners Proved It. By all means, go read it. It's mind blowing. And though it's not overly technical, it can definitely be a lot to wrap your mind around. It can absolutely be a bit of a mind f If you're not at least a little bit initiated into this topic, the topic of quantum weirdness in general. And for the majority of this video, I'm not even going to color outside the lines philosophically. I'm not gonna make any big wooey reaches because the mainstream scientific consensus at this point is enough to break reality on its own. That said, because I am who I am, toward the end of this video, we will do a little bit of wonder dipping, a little bit of philosophical exploration on the implications that quantum physics implies. So I'm gonna start by reading you the opening paragraph of this article because they just destroy reality right out of the gate. Quote, one of the more unsettling discoveries of the past half century is that the universe is not locally real. Real, meaning that objects have definite properties independent of observation. For example, that an apple can be red even when no one is looking. Local, meaning objects can only be influenced by their surroundings, and that any influence cannot travel faster than light. Continuing, the evidence shows objects are not influenced solely by their surroundings, and they may also lack definite properties prior to measurement. As Albert Einstein famously bemoaned to a friend, do you really believe the moon is not there when you're not looking at it? It turns out, according to quantum physics, and this is mainstream science, remember, the answer seems to be no. That if there's nothing measuring, perceiving, or looking, no, it's not there. That it only exists as a kind of informational potential. So yeah, highly spooky stuff. The universe is not locally real and objects do not have definite properties until measured. Stop and appreciate that this is mainstream science. Now, I'm sure this is already making a number of you uncomfortable. You're already giving me the, the squinty, sus, side eye, or maybe you think my interpretation is too extreme. But before you decide, before you rain your judgment down upon me, let's talk about what that means and how scientists reach this conclusion that reality, as we see it, is not really locally real. Though the origins of quantum physics go back further than this, I think it makes sense to start in 1935, because that's when an early quantum physicist, Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein, started having public debates about the nature of reality. Bohr was a proponent of everything we're talking about. He believed that quantum weirdness was real, that reality may not be locally real at all. But Einstein could not accept this. So that's when Einstein and two other physicists, Podolsky and Rosen, got together and put together a formal objection to quantum physics. For short, people call this trio EPR for their last names. And they also refer to their general argument as EPR as well. But the paper isn't famous for what it proved. It's famous for what it couldn't prove. This EPR squad were in a way trying to save the cosmos from the clutches of this quantum weirdness. They were trying to keep reality sensical. Not only did they fail to do that, in a way they were inadvertently lighting the fuse of a sort of ontological explosion because this paper inspired the mathematics and the experiments that would prove quantum physics is true. One of the core elements of quantum physics that the EPR trio set out to poke holes in is this idea of non-locality that we've already talked about, that particles seem to be able to somehow instantaneously influence one another, that there seems to be some kind of information transfer between the two particles that violates the speed of light. Here again is a great quote from the article that sums it up. And remember, this is an argument that this trio of scientists are making to try to show why quantum physics is absurd, that it doesn't make sense. Quote, pairs of particles are sent off in different directions from a common source. 
targeted for two observers, Alice and Bob, each stationed at opposite ends of the solar system. Quantum mechanics dictates that it's impossible to know the spin, a quantum property of individual particles, prior to measurement. When Alice measures one of her particles, she finds the spin to either be up or down. Her results are random, and yet when she measures up, she instantly knows Bob's corresponding particle must be down. At first glance, this is not so odd. Perhaps the particles are like a pair of socks. If Alice gets the right sock, then Bob must have the left. But under quantum mechanics, particles are not like socks. Only when measured do they settle on spin up or spin down. So again, this is already a lot to process. These particles don't have qualities prior to measurement according to quantum physics. You can see why this would bother Einstein. He believed we lived in a deterministic, sensical universe. He famously said God doesn't play dice to illustrate that point. So here's the supposed absurdity that Einstein and company were trying to point out. That if you have two particles on opposite ends of the solar system, and one is measured, and we find out that its spin is up, how does that other particle on the other end of the solar system by Bob know that its spin is down? How does it instantaneously reflect the quality of the other particle? It just doesn't make sense, is what the EPR trio were arguing. Sounds like a pretty solid argument, but here's the problem. Real-world versions of this EPR scenario were eventually done, and every time they reinforced the quantum weirdness. They showed that this exactly is what happened. This spooky action at a distance that seems to violate the speed of light does happen. So in the wake of EPR, there's sort of a bifurcation in the scientific community. You get one group of physicists saying, yeah, quantum physics doesn't seem to make intuitive sense, but it seems to be where the evidence is pointing, so we're gonna go with it. And you have another group who's more sympathetic to Einstein and the EPR group in general, saying, no, there must be something we're not seeing. There must be hidden variables that allow particles to communicate instantaneously. This does not make sense. So this idea of hidden variables became a huge one. I mean, imagine if you could find some mechanism that allows you to transmit information instantly, who knows what kind of breakthroughs it would lead to. And plus, you sort of get to resuscitate reality. You get to prove that things do make sense, that this spooky action at a distance is not so spooky. And this is where a now famous particle physicist, John Stuart Bell, comes into the picture. Bell was also bothered by this quantum weirdness. He was more sympathetic toward this hidden variable argument. So he devised a genius bit of math to actually ascertain whether or not hidden variables might be at play. I'm not gonna get into the technicals of how the Bell test would work, but if you wanna know, check out a video that I linked in the description. The important takeaway from what Bell put forth is that he actually devised a way of making these hidden variables go from hypothetical to mathematical and testable. Whether or not there was a way to make quantum physics make more sense in a way that would have made Einstein happy. Are you still with me? Well, it kind of doesn't even matter because the punchline is, is that over the decades, again and again, the quantum weirdness won out. Physicists like the Nobel Prize winning trio for this year, John Clauser, Alan Aspect, and Anton Zellinger, did actual Bell tests. They did actual experiments to see if there were hidden variables or if there really was this spooky action at a distance. Now, again, I'm hugely nutshelling. I'm fast forwarding multiple decades. Several potential loopholes to the quantum weirdness did emerge along the way, but as of now, the vast majority of scientists agree the loopholes have been closed, particularly by a 2017 experiment conducted by Zellinger, which did this Bell test on a cosmic scale. Particles were shot out into outer space, and they still displayed this instantaneous information transfer with no hidden variables. So the quantum weirdness is real. The world is not locally real in the way that our senses tell us it is, that even most of our scientific instruments tell us it is. Moreover, until they're measured, things just exist in a kind of potential. They don't have actual attributes until they are measured. What does this mean? Well, practically, technologically, I think it means we're on the verge of some 
huge, huge breakthroughs. If you look at this emerging field of quantum computing, they're aimed at some absolute world altering problems. Quantum computing may be able to solve diseases, may be able to simulate whole realistic natural worlds and tell us fundamental things about reality that to this day are mysteries. But for me, there's a huge throbbing philosophical question right beneath the surface. What is the role of consciousness in that measurement? Now, if we go back to the Bob and Alice scenario, where you have Bob and Alice stationed on opposite ends of the solar system, and when Alice measures her particle and finds the spin is up, Bob's instantaneously takes on the quality of a spin of down. Now, admittedly, where I'm about to go causes most materialist scientists orify to pucker. They do not like the idea that reality and consciousness are somehow entangled, that this act of measurement requires consciousness. There are even studies that claim to show that consciousness has nothing to do with measurement. And that may be true if we're talking solely about human consciousness. But what if consciousness is fundamental? What if some level of consciousness has always existed? Some physicists do believe this, most famously Eugene Wigner. You're probably familiar with the famous thought experiment put forth by Schrodinger, Schrodinger's cat. Uh, essentially that if you put a cat into a box with radioactive material or a lethal poison and you seal it, not only do you not know if that cat is alive or dead, according to the principles implied by quantum physics, it's neither alive nor dead until it is measured or witnessed. But then Wigner comes along with a really interesting add-on to that thought experiment. So as I was working on this, I came across this clip of the physicist Michio Kaku talking about this exact thing on the show Through the Wormhole. Check this out. Eugene Wigner believed it could teach us something else about the working of the universe. That consciousness controls everything. Wigner said, Let's take it one step farther. If I, a human being, looks at the cat, I am conscious. Therefore, consciousness determines existence. At that point, Einstein went ballistic and said, what? You're saying that the fact that you are a conscious being determines the fact that the cat is alive? The answer is yes. And Wigner made one more step. And that is, how do I know I'm alive? You see, the cat and me, we're part of the same universe. If I don't know the cat is alive or dead, I could also be dead at the same time and not even know it. So who determines that I'm alive? Well, Wigner's friend looks at me, I look at the cat, and we exist. But then who looks at Wigner's friend? And there's an infinite chain of people looking at people, looking at people, until finally you hit cosmic consciousness. Some consciousness that's ethereal, that envelops the universe, which looks at us and says, aha, the cat is alive. And Wigner was not the only one who thought that quantum physics had these almost mystical implications that hinged on consciousness. Schrodinger himself believed that consciousness is fundamental. And later on in life, Schrodinger himself got very mystical. He did deep dives into Vedanta and Eastern philosophy in general. So this idea that quantum physics implies something central and important about consciousness, I don't think is that far-fetched. As Eugene Wigner puts it, when the province of physical theory was extended to encompass microscopic phenomena through the creation of quantum physics, the concept of consciousness came to the fore. It was not possible to formulate the laws of quantum mechanics in a fully consistent way without reference to the consciousness. So at a minimum, my friends, we live in a very strange universe that we do not fully understand. This is what quantum physics is telling us, that reality is not locally real and that things do not have definite qualities prior to measurement. And then if we go a step further and we ask the question, what is that measurement? What is going on with the measurement problem? And is consciousness directly involved in that process? And if so, does that mean consciousness is fundamental? My friends, I have many, many more thoughts on this, but they're going to start to meander beyond the scope of this video. So we'll stop there. Is consciousness fundamental uh, for what it's worth? 
this wonder dipping weirdo suspects that it is for more reasons than what we discussed in this video by the way for instance if you want to go deep down the rabbit hole check out this podcast let me know what you think in the comments of course i would be ever so grateful if you tickle the algorithms with a like and a sub and that's it for this wonder dip